Hello and welcome back to Columbia University Physics Preceptor TV. Today we're going to be talking about experiment 210, it's the absorption of beta and gamma rays. So many years ago, physicists noticed that certain nuclei could split into other nuclei plus smaller particles, and they call this uh, radioactive decay. Uh, in particular, they found three types of radioactive decays. They didn't really know what it was at first, so they just called them alpha, beta, and gamma, first three letters. Uh, so basically, you'd have something like nucleus one would go to some other nucleus, plus one of the particles, alpha, beta, and gamma. It's a generic, generic um, radioactive decay. It later turned out that this alpha particle, that they didn't know what it was, in fact also in itself was a nucleus, it was a helium nucleus, helium-4. Uh, the beta particle was in fact not a nucleus, it was an electron, and the gamma was uh, in fact light, photon. So one particular um, application of this radioactive decay that I want to just mention real quick, and the um, lab notebook, uh, lab manual also mentions it, um, is the decay of a neutron into a proton and an electron through beta decay. So at first it was thought that this neutron, uh, it's kind of just sitting there, sitting still, that's the idea at least, decays into a proton plus an electron. These were the only particles that you saw on the right hand side, so of course the neutron then decayed into the proton and electron. But just like when you have in elementary mechanics, if you were to have, for example, a, an air track, and in fact, you've, you, most of you have done this experiment already, uh, with two carts on the air track attached by a spring, if you let go of the spring and they fly apart, they fly apart with distinct um, velocities that always are the same, I mean, within uncertainty, every time you reproduce the experiment. Similarly, you would then exper expect this neutron, instead, instead of the two carts here, you have these, this one neutron, and then all of a sudden exploding into a proton and an electron, um, to also always have the same velocities every time you perform the experiment. However, what, if you measure the, the uh, velocities of these, you in fact see that there's some type of distribution. So if you look instead of the velocity, if you look at the kinetic energy, and you look at how often, um, you, instead of finding some peak, which you expect, you expect it to be the same kinetic energy every time, you see that there's some type of distribution. So Fermi was uh, really smart in trying to understand why this was happening, and he decided that maybe there was another particle that we couldn't see on the right-hand side, and he called it the neutrino. In fact, in this case, it's an antineutrino. And this antineutrino would, in that, in that case, take this extra amount of energy away, and depending on how much this one took away, you know, the electron would be left with different amounts of energies. So, um, the reason I mention this is uh, partly because it's a good uh, example of radioactive decay, but also because uh, uh, this uh, neutrino here occurs very, very often in popular science right now. It's a very current topic in physics. So open any, any Discover magazine or popular science or anything like that, you're bound to see these neutrinos. So now you know basically where they came from or where they were first uh, talked about. Uh, in our experiment today, we're going to be using something called a Geiger counter. So let me just go through really quickly how a Geiger counter works. It's something that measures radioactivity or radioactive decay products so that you don't have to go in and measure them yourselves. Um, so a Geiger counter is basically just a tube that's been, you've gotten rid of all the air in, in the tube and instead you have some gas, some inert gas, perhaps argon or something. In the center in here, you have a, basically a wire that's charged at a positive potential I think it's a po yeah, positive potential, and then the, um, the outside here is, at, is actually grounded. Now, if everything is like this, you know, some inert gas, all the atoms are neutral, uh, there will be no current flowing, even though there's a difference in potential, there will be no current flowing in here. So if you have these two wires, you know, hooked up maybe to an ammeter, you would see no current over here. Now, if you were to place an electron or some other charged particle inside of here, of course, it would flow towards one of the, um, one of the anode or the, this uh, shell around here, um, and as such would produce a current. So the idea behind the Geiger counter is that if one of these alpha, beta, or gamma particles, let's say it's a beta particle, an electron, comes in here, it might strike one of the argon molecules or atoms, and, and as such would ionize it. So instead of being neutral, it's a plus and a minus part, and then these parts would, in respect, they would start bump bumping into other things and 
uh, create more plus and minus particles, and eventually you'd have all these charged particles in here that would ultimately be able to flow to one, one or the other. And as such, you'd find some type of current in the circuit. So this is a general way a Geiger counter works. By measuring this cur current, or in our case, listening for the click sound, uh, you'll be able to detect if, um, um, if a, an electron or a photon or an alpha particle has entered your, your Geiger counter. Actually, in our case, we won't be listening to the click sound. We'll have a counter that does it for us. So let's get to the actual uh, idea behind the experiment. So the idea is that if you have some type of radioactive uh, material over, over here that's letting out all these particles, maybe photons or alpha particles or electrons, uh, if you place some type of shield in between, so it could be aluminum in the case of beta um, particles, or it could be lead in the case of um, gamma particles, we'll do both of them today, you'll find that the number of incident particles is actually larger than the number of particles making it to the other side. So some of them are going to be kind of stopped by this barrier. And of course, the thicker this barrier is, the more particles are going to be stopped. So what we're going to do, we're going to try to figure out exactly how, how many particles are, um, um, are redirected by this barrier, depending on its thickness. We're going to do that first for electrons, and then secondly for photons. So if an electron then goes through one of these materials, it's going to start bouncing into certain things. And after a while, after bouncing into a sufficiently large number of uh, molecules or atoms, it's going to simply stop. Now we have a formula in the, um, in the lab notebook, which is it can prove itself uh, very useful for us, which sta states that this distance at which this happens, the range, is equal to 0.412 grams per centimeter squared divided by the density of the material, in this case we'll be using aluminum, and I'll give you the density of that very shortly, times the energy of the electron raised to the 1.29th power. So in this formula, R is supposed to be measured in centimeters, and the energy here is supposed to be measured in mega electron volts, and this density here, in our example, is going to be the same thing as aluminum, which is, let's see here, 2.702 grams per centimeters cubed. So we're going to measure the range for this um, for uh, uh, beta um, beta particles in the case of aluminum, and we're going to be able to talk a little bit about what the energy of these beta particles are, these electrons. In the case of light, it's a little bit trickier because light doesn't really stop in the same way that electrons does uh, electrons do. Instead, if you have a certain number of photons incident on a piece of lead, let's say this lead gets rid of a ratio, only let's through a certain ratio. Let's say it gets rid of uh, mu, um, a ratio of mu of the incident electron. So let's say there are 10 incidents and mu is a half, then only five would make it out on the other side. Um, in that case, the number of, uh, of photons that, that disappear throughout this one barrier is equal to, or it's equal to minus because they disappear, and times this mu, this ratio, times the thickness, because it's this mu is valid for the specific thickness, and then multiplied by the number of incident particles. And you can see that when you take delta x, the thickness of this material, and very small, of course the number of uh, photons that disappear are going to be very small, and this is going to turn itself into a differential equation. So if you divide both sides by delta x, you get dn dx is equal to minus mu times n. And the solution of this differential equation is, it's very similar to the one we had when we did the capacitor, uh, capacitor lab a few labs ago. We find that the number of photons that make it out on the other side is equal to the number of incident photons times e to the minus mu x. So this is kind of the equation we're going to try to verify. In fact, we're going to verify it much like we did um, for the capacitance um, lab a few, few, uh, few labs back by graphing it on a semi-log paper, and then we're going to deduce what the, this mu here is. And then once we know mu, we're going to use a little extra trick to find out what the energy of these photons were. So let's start with the specifics of the experiment. For the beta particles, or for both particles, the first thing we're going to have to do actually is measure the background. Because even if you don't have one of these radioactive sources around, or even though you're not actually intending on measuring one of them, uh, you might still have other radioactive sources near you, such as, you know, the other lab groups, they might have uh, um, 
radioactive sources near, near, near enough to you so that it could influence your experiment. So the first thing we're going to try to do is we're going to try to tuck away all the stuff that we have that might be radioactive and measure simply the background. And that's something we're going to keep around um, for the rest of the experiment. You might want to update the background as you go just to make sure it's still accurate in case something significant changes. So the apparatus kind of looks like this. You have the Geiger counter like I described before on top and you have this kind of box. Um, in the, in the bottom of the box, you have your radioactive sample, which in the case of beta decay, so for beta, we're going to have thallium. Uh, in the case, yeah, so that's for beta. So now this is going to uh, um, release a bunch of electrons. And there are certain slots in here that give us room for, for placing uh, sh metal sheets in. And we're going to simply start placing these aluminum sheets in here and see how this count starts changing. And what we're going to eventually graph on semi-log paper, I assume that you're familiar with this from the capacitance lab, we're going to graph as a function of the, the, the log of the count, or on semi-log paper it would simply just then be the count, versus the thickness. And the, the background that we measured is going to be somewhere here, something that actually is not created by our thallium source, but it could be other things around. Um, and we're going to see some type of plot that looks like this. After a certain amount of distance, you're going to see this just simply flatlining. It's not going to decrease anymore because it can't decrease more than the background. Because basically what we're doing is we're inserting more and more metal between the, uh, the, the source down here and the counter. We can't take away more than all of them. Even when we take away all the electrons that this thing produces, there's still going to be in, uh, other electrons from the environment. So at this point, this, we've gotten rid of all the electrons, and this is simply the range that I discussed before in that formula. In the formula, R is equal to 0.412 divided by grams per centimeter squared um, divided by density times energy to the 1.29. That's simply then this range. Then from, from this range, you can deduce what the energy of the electrons were using this formula. Now, in the second case, the setup looks identical. But we're going to use, instead of thallium, because we're not interested in beta particles or electrons anymore, we're interested in, um, um, in photons. So in this case, we're going to use cesium-137. And the same thing goes again. We're going to start putting sheets in between here. But instead of aluminum, we're going to put lead, because lead stops uh, photons much, much better. And then again, we're going to get some type of, of uh, graph on the semi-log graph. But this time, because we, we, um, we expected to follow this behavior, we're actually going to find that instead of this kind of weird behavior where it had a little curve in the beginning and the end, it's actually just going to be a simple straight line. Um, and this time around, um, we should actually uh, subtract out um, the background. So what you're actually going to graph is not going to have this background line in it. You should, from all your measurements, subtract out simply what the background is. And then the intercept is then simply going to be the range. Or um, no. What you're interested in is the slope of this thing. So the slope of this is going to be related to your constant mu. And that's what you're going to try to um, establish. Now once you have mu, there's another nice graph on, on page 5 that, looks, that graphs mu compared to the energy of the photons. It looks kind of like this. It's actually a semi-log plot on the x-axis. And um, from here, when you, once you know what your mu is, you can go ahead and determine what the energy of the photons were. And according to the lab notebook, the energy of these uh, photons should be approximately 0.662 MeV. So that's approximately what you should find. But as you see, the graph is fairly steep here, so even um, so the point is that even if you make a small mistake in, in mu, even if you get a some, somewhat inaccurate result over here, you might still get a large fluctuation in the energy. So uh, that's basically the, the, the lab. Let me just go over a few extra notes just to make sure that all the subtleties are clear. Of course, there are always uncertainties. And in this case, the uncertainties um, are pretty simple to calculate. Suppose that you count 
n counts in, in your Geiger counter, you should record that as n plus minus the square root of n. So let's say you had 100 counts, you should record that as 100 plus minus 10. So that's going to give you your error bars. The second thing is that when you do these experiments, you're going to have to um, put in more and more of these sheets. Now, in the case of aluminum, it's not that big of a deal because the aluminum sheets are so thin that you can easily fit extra aluminum sheets in. But the lead sheets are actually fairly thick. So you should um, prepare yourself for putting these extra sheets in by um, placing the first sheet fairly far down. This way you give yourself more room for additional sheets. The reason why this is important is that suppose that you start with your sheet up here and your source down here. All those photons that go out on the outside are simply lost. The ones that barely make it might still bounce in and make it into the counter up here. Now if you start moving this up and down, then you see that these extra ones that went out before that didn't even participate in the experiment are now going to, if you place it down here, are now going to have the opportunity of bouncing into the Geiger counter. So you want to make sure that you keep this, the lowest one on a constant level and then see, simply add more uh, sheets on top of that. That's pretty much all I have to say, so good luck and have fun with the experiment.